On this episode of China Unscripted, Russia invaded Ukraine and China is taking notes. Is Taiwan next? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Germont Leilary, a retired U.S. Air Force foreign area officer who specialized in counterterrorism, the Middle East, and Europe is now conducting research at the National Zhengzhou University in Taipei as a Taiwan fellow. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sorry it's under such horrible, horrible uh, global events. Well, you know, uh, not like this wasn't uh, anticipated uh, by a lot of people, and some people didn't anticipate it, but unfortunately it's, it's happening. Reality check. Yeah, and I'm really glad to see just NATO is handling it so well. Uh, You know, money well spent. So, uh, do you want to say something, Shai? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. All right, well, so let's get to it. You know, China has been watching Russia very closely, uh, not just for this invasion, but also for, uh, you know, back in Crimea in 2014. Uh, What are they looking for? So I I would recommend we take a little step back and recall that on the 4th of February this year, Xi and uh, Putin met, uh, you know, got a photo op, uh, signed a deal uh, worth, I think, $112 billion for gas and oil. And then on the side of that, they signed a 5,000 page, sorry, 5,000 word document um, basically committing themselves to, you know, be, being uh, best friends forever. Um, and in that document, there's some very important um, references to Taiwan and the military. So, you know, if we use that as a context for looking uh, as, a, as a prism to look at this uh, event, uh, I would argue that, in fact, China knew about this way in advance uh, as you probably know, China has been exercising with the Russian military. Um, I, th- I, I looked it up uh, 30 times. They've done 30 major exercises in the last roughly 20 years. And uh, so they're in tune with the Russian military and they know what's what the Russians are going to be doing. Uh, so I would say the first thing that they're going to be uh, looking for is uh, how this whole thing transpires, transpires, not just the kinetic part, which was what Everyone's watching, you know, on their TVs or on their, um, you know, uh, cell phones. I think uh, we need to go back again before the kinetic part started and and, uh, look at some of the psychological and political warfare things that were done prior to uh, the event. Uh, Cyber attacks were done before the kinetic attacks. So they're looking at everything. Okay, this is this is for them like uh, candy. Candy uh, in terms of how they can proceed with their expansion, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's South China Sea, whether it's other parts uh, in the area of China. So, so if you want me to get some specific uh, specific um, areas, um, uh, for the first area they're looking at is joint operations. Um, Russia is very good at joint operations. They've done it a lot. <laughs> In the past, uh, obviously, uh, you mentioned Crimea, uh, Georgia, um, and internally they've done uh, acts against their own people in Chechnya and other places. So uh, joint operations are very important because you bring to bear multiple dimensions to 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 war. Uh, So air, land, and sea, and space, and cyber. They're looking at all those, and I, I suspect, again, I have no proof of this, but that either they're having, they have their own people in the joint operations centers uh, that Russia is conducting the war from, or at least they have a good connectivity to get daily updates on the pr- progress of the war and to be able to ans- ask questions and get answers from the Russians. So are you saying that this Russia's current military operations in Ukraine are actually going to inform what the Chinese Communist Party itself does when it's going into Taiwan or going into the South China Sea? Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, uh, having been involved with uh, several military operations myself, I know how important it is to uh, 
to be uh, involved uh, in a conflict. Uh, and I believe that they have their people or they have connectivity to the to the uh, joint operations centers that the Russians are conducting this this operation. And they're definitely going to be getting a lot of feedback from it once it's uh, once it calms down. Uh, obviously, the uh, the eventual um, takeover of Ukraine uh, will have a lot of lessons learned for the Russians, and I'm sure that they'll be glad to share them with the Chinese. So speaking of lessons, you know, there were some signs that uh, Russia was going to invade Ukraine. But, you know, looking back, obviously, hindsight uh, is 2020 and can give us some better idea of this. Like, what were the signs that Russia was about to invade Ukraine that we should really learn from this, that we in the West should learn from this? Okay. Um, so first of all, I mean, the, the obvious things, um, 2014, they invaded Crimea. I mean, if that wasn't a, a good lesson right there, that was clearly a, a message to the, to the Ukrainians that they, uh, uh, they were looking, looking at Ukraine as a, as an, as a next step. Um, the, um, the, also the, um, the military buildup. I mean, that was clearly happening for months. <laughs> um, no matter what Putin said, uh, the military was building up. And uh, if you had wa been watching uh, any of the um, uh, tweets of people who watched the military, uh, they were clearly uh, noticing movements of, of ar armor and um, different... Um, Units, Air Force, Navy, etc. Uh, so, and then just before the attacks, there were plenty of cyber cyber events happening just before the kinetic part ha happened, and also continue during this, you know, during the kinetic part. So, there were lots of indicators that I thought were pretty clear, and also, you know, there there were some statements that Putin made. Um, that indicated that he was um, going to do something. Yeah. How, how long ago do you think it should have been clear that this invasion was going to happen? Well, at least since they took over Crimea, <laughs> that was a clear, pretty clear indication. So that was like eight years ago. Correct. <laughs> Because I thought you were going to say like, oh, you know, late December or early January with the, but you're saying like, we should have known eight years ago that this was an eventuality. Yeah. I mean, if, you know, if, if a country takes over, you know, 7% um, of your country and doesn't continue, I would think that you would uh, put maximum effort into building up your defense, training your people. It's only since last year that they even thought about getting women involved in the military to increase their numbers. I mean, if someone had taken Alaska from the United States and stopped there, I, I think we would have probably gotten pretty, you know, pretty aggressive about increasing our, our strengths to kick, kick them out, A, or B, at least defend ourselves the next time they come through. Well, so it sounds like the writing was on the wall that, you know, this was going to happen. And it's also very clear that China intends to invade Taiwan. Uh, clearly, the West was unsuccessful at preventing a Russian invasion of Ukraine. What should have happened that would also prevent an invasion of Taiwan well, from happening? I mean, I, I don't know. Is there anything that the West could have done? It, or was it just that we didn't start talking about it to too late because... The Biden administration was warning that Russia is going to invade for a couple of weeks, right? Well, I mean, but, this this goes back to Crimea in 2014. Yeah, but I mean, well, warning is different than doing something. Well, I mean, it is at that point was it already too late to do something, or you know, or were like there a things few weeks we could ago. have done? Yeah. So uh, to answer your okay, so there's two questions I heard. I heard the, the question about Taiwan and the question about Ukraine. So I'll, I'll hit the Taiwan question. As you probably know. Up until 1979, the U.S. military was four deployed to Taiwan. From 1950, uh, starting with the Korean War, there were U.S. forces deployed to Taiwan. And then 1955, the U.S. set up an entire command of 
um, military personnel, including Air Force, Army, and Navy, uh, it averaged between 4,000 and 20,000 troops in Taiwan up until 1979. So that's about 20, 24 years that we had military personnel deployed to Taiwan conducting military operations. During that time, the, um, the Chinese, the PRC, specifically the PLA, um, conducted attacks against Taiwan, first in the Taiwan Strait crisis, and then in the second one. The first one was in the early 50s. The second one was in, I think, 1958. And in both cases, we had military, U.S. military personnel on the ground, and, the, and still the PLA was attacking, okay? So we withdrew our troops in 1979 as a result of the deal between uh, um, Nixon, no, sorry, Carter, Carter finished the deal that Nixon started in 1970, in the early 1970s. Uh, we even had nuclear weapons um, in Taiwan up until 1974. Uh, I think that was from it's about uh, almost 15 to 20 years. We had nuclear weapons. It's it's you can find it in the National Archives referencing uh, the nuclear weapons that we had stationed in, in Taiwan. So what do we do today to, to deal with this thing? Well, I think the only thing we can do is um, we need to we need to send the U.S. military troops to Taiwan and stake a claim, you know, reclaim what we were doing before. Because, look, ships take a while to get to Taiwan. Army troops take a while to get to, to Taiwan. You can't just snap your finger and have a bunch of military personnel sh show up. So it's good. It, if the Chinese, if the if the CCP chooses the right time to attack t Taiwan, when there are very few naval ships in the area, there's not much stopping them. And you know, imagine, re recall that in the early '50s, the Chinese didn't have nuclear weapons. It was only until the early '60s. So they were they were quote ballsy enough to attack Taiwan, even though the U.S. was military was in Taiwan. So imagine what it's like now where there is no military, U.S. military in Taiwan, no nuclear weapons in Taiwan. China is building up its nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, it's going to take a lot of effort on not only the U.S., but the rest of the allies to stake a claim and, and prevent China from invading Taiwan. Well, so what about this? Like, this is an argument I'm hearing currently with Putin and Ukraine. But People would say to your idea, oh, well, that would be antagonizing the Chinese Communist Party. That would be making them more hostile and aggressive. We don't want to do that. That's the same thing people are saying about the situation in Ukraine. Like, oh, it's because he felt threatened. Okay, I'm going to put a little emotional uh, spin on this. Well, that's what Chamberlain you know, thought about Hitler, right? Appeasement doesn't work with dictatorships. <laughs> so... You know, uh, our existence, this, the existence of democracies in the world is an, is an offense, is offensive to the CCP. So, you know, the only way to deal with that is either we uh, fight back in a way uh, that keeps it from going nuclear or, um, or we give up. I mean, that's pretty much the choice. Uh, I mean, Taiwan also has to take responsibility here and step up and and uh, you know, get their 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 people uh, trained, and, and there are people trained there, and they're and they're doing their a good job of it. But you know, just like Ukraine, um, you know, even the even the I think the foreign minister uh, made a statement a couple of months ago saying that you know he believes that 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 the that the that the PRC via the PLA is going to attack Taiwan. So you know, everybody needs to get 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 going on this it's it's you know it's it's now <laughs> we can't wait till they start attacking and then respond uh, because if we wait for that it'll be over before we even have an opportunity to get to get there so do you think that china will want to invade taiwan regardless of whether or not we station troops in taiwan i think that it will be a stronger argument for to deter them, but it might not deter them. But it would definitely anger them. Well, yeah, I mean, it would have angered um, Putin if we had stationed U.S. military in Ukraine. <laughs> uh, you know, but are we are we willing to risk uh, war with Russia? You know, because of it, are we going to are we going to are we uh, are we going to 
Um, but what's the purpose of NATO, right? NATO is, is supposed to be an alliance to protect, um, you know, first it was 12 countries, now it's 30 countries from aggression. The only country that's nearby is Russia. So the NATO alliance is offensive to, to Russia, but do we disband NATO because it's offensive to Russia and it could lead to nuclear war? No, we don't. So, you know, we need to we need to move forward. Uh, we need to do things. Now, you probably read some articles about U.S. military currently in, in Taiwan. Uh, there was a couple of reports uh, l- late fall where they, they mentioned about 100 uh, military personnel training Taiwanese. So, you know, it's already it's already out there that we have military in Taiwan. I don't personally know this, but I'm just reading the press. But, you know. So what's the what's the what's the what's the problem of moving it from a hundred to a thousand, and then a year from now to five thousand? You know, like, you know, we we need to we need to move forward on this. I know there's a lot of a lot of agreements out there about you know, well, we don't want to you know upset the uh, balance of power and all this all this kind of stuff. I I think that we need to. I think there's enough, enough smart policy people out there that if there's a will, there's a way. We'll, we can figure out how to how to help Taiwan, as well as using our allies. I mean, the first thing I would recommend um, as a first step, and it would probably be the least offensive to the CCP, we should station a U.S. Navy Ag- Aegis ship off the shore of Taiwan that only purpose is to shoot down missiles that would be fired from China. It's not in Taiwan, it's in international waters, and it can just sit there and be replaced by other US Navy and as well as other allies have Aegis capability um, on their on some of their on, the, on their ships. So we could have a rotation of uh, different countries coming up and, and uh, uh, setting up a picket of uh, U.S. Navy missile defense uh, mission ships off the coast of Taiwan. Second thing we could do is we could deploy a THAAD unit, just like we deployed a THAAD unit to South Korea and to Guam, which is the Army's version of missile defense on the island of Taiwan. Again, completely defensive. How is that? How is that offensive? Well, the THAAD unit in the South Korea was pretty offensive to the CCP. Right. It was offensive because they claimed that, that the, the radar could see deep into their territory and, you know, they didn't want uh, the U.S. to do that. But eventually, guess what? It's still there. S- South Korea and China have um, made amends, but it's still there. You know, so so if it was so offensive. Why is it still there? And, and the same thing in the Middle East. I mean, you know, the U.S. has a lot of... Uh, missile defense assets all over the Middle East. I'm sure it's offensive to Iran, um, but, you know, it's there for a reason. That, that's the first step. If you want to, you know, you want to do it nice incrementally, you know, not to not to rock rock the, uh, the CCP too much. That's something you could do without really much fanfare. I mean, I don't think they could blame the U.S. for, uh, you know, incrementally adding military buildup in the region. Sure they could. They don't understand what hypocrisy is. <laughs> <laughs> or, or irony, yeah. Well, so do you think the invasion of Ukraine has moved up or delayed the timetable for China invading Taiwan? I think, uh, in, uh, I hate to answer it this way, I think both. I think in the sense that it's delayed because the CCP and the PLA want to learn lessons from this event and they want to put them into 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 practice and then they'll need to train for them. So in a sense, it'll take time before they can ingest the lessons learned um, and uh, update whatever they need to update, whether it's training, whether it's um, equipment, communications, uh, weapons. On the other hand, um, this could also embolden them because they saw how passive the West has been in terms of the Ukraine. You know, Ukraine had 120, 130 countries with embassies, you know, in 
in in the Ukraine and it had embassies in those 130 countries. Taiwan has 14 or 13 countries in the world that recognize it. I mean, it's if you just compa- do a simple comparison of of the situation of Ukraine versus Taiwan, Ukraine has had much more recognition, had much more connectivity, had um, you know was a member of the UN, and yet this is what happens: nothing. The West does nothing, basically. So what the what the West's message is to Putin is: you can take Ukraine, but don't take anything else. Don't take any of the. Don't mess with the NATO countries, but you're free to play with any non-NATO country. That's the message that I received. Well, I want to push back a bit on that. The idea that the West has done nothing. There have been economic sanctions levied against uh, Putin and Russia, trying to go after the uh, you know the Russian oligarchs, trying to get them out of the you know global financial institutions. And I know, uh, like even that, that's something like Gary Kasparov has been recommending versus, you know, putting boots on the ground necessarily. Um, but so we did do the same. So Chris, we did the same thing when Russia invaded Crimea mm-hmm. and see how successful that was. Well, so then what would be successful? The issue is, is what are we willing to fight for? That's, that's really the issue, right? Are, are we willing to send uh, men and women to fight in a foreign country for a foreign country? And if so, what are the criteria for that? And that applies to Taiwan or any other country that we've sent troops to. It has to become a vital interest of the United States to protect uh, an ally. Now we have written agreements, NATO, for example, uh, Japan, South Korea, these are countries we have agreements in play that say we will come to their defense if they're attacked. We don't have that agree, those agreements with Ukraine and Taiwan. So I guess the first step would be to make that uh, an agreement to state, state that, or make it part of NATO or make it part of another uh, larger alliance. But until we are willing to step up and say that we're willing to send a, a our military to defend another country, then we're pretty much messaging the dictators of the world, you know, you have free play. I mean, don't we have a mutual defense agreement with Taiwan? So it, it, it's kind of, if you read it, it's kind of strange. Okay. Uh, It's ambiguous. That's the term that they use. Okay. It's ambiguous. What it does is it says that We want Taiwan and the PRC to resolve their differences without violence. And and we support Taiwan's defense through the sale of weapons. Doesn't say that we'll deploy troops to Taiwan. Doesn't say that we'll defend Taiwan. It says we'll help Taiwan by selling them weapons. So that's not the same thing as our treaty, our alliance with Japan and South Korea and NATO. That's not the same thing. And notice in all those cases I just mentioned, we have military personnel deployed to those locations. Uh, You know, we kind of have something in Taiwan, but it's nothing compared to what we've got in other places. So we don't really have we don't really have the same commitment. Uh, It was written originally uh, because there was a fear that, um, and it was valid at, at one point, Chiang Kai-shek had a plan to reinvade China in the 60s. And we didn't want to get pulled into some situation where there was, let's say, an attack, uh, and it appeared to be that the PLA was doing it, and when it wasn't, it was instigated by... Anyway, we didn't want to get pulled into something that we wanted to be able to not get involved if we didn't want to. The other, the other treaties or alliances we have, it pretty much says if they're attacked, we're going to help them. Taiwan, it doesn't say that. It says that it allows us the uh, sort of the squishy situation of where we can we can choose if we want to get involved. You know, I'm wondering if you could comment on this, but I think the timing of the invasion was interesting that they 
it's like it, it happened right after the Olympics. Was that a coincidence or, you know, maybe Putin was watching the games and he was really he got really upset that that Russian figure skater got disqualified uh, and that's what put it. him over the edge. But the straw that broke the camel couldn't back. have the gold. So he decided to take Ukraine instead. Consolation prize. That may be true. But uh, let me remind you again, sort of historically, that the Russians have used or and also the Soviets have used the Olympics repeatedly as a means or as a timeline for conducting operations. The first one was 1980, uh, and we boycotted them because they went into Afghanistan. The second time was um, in 2008, I think it was the, 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 the I forget which Olympic, it was it Sochi? No, Sochi was Georgia. Sochi was Georgia. Um, and then um, there was the third Olympics, Oh, the Beijing Olympics, when they took Crimea, and this will be the fourth. So I guess that looks like a pattern to me. <laughs> so I think the only thing we can do is stop having Olympics. <laughs> I don't mind that idea. <laughs> Great idea, Shelley. <laughs> Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me, Fool me a third time. Uh, wonder what's on Eurovision. <laughs> what's, Fool me what a about fourth, fourth time? time? <laughs> uh, I got a. Get off social media. <laughs> um, well, here's something else that like, people have been mentioning. Like, there, I don't know if this is connected. I'd like to hear your thoughts. But there have been, let's call them some sketchy dealings uh, in both Ukraine and China with uh, President Biden's son, Hunter Biden. How do you think that affects anything that's happening today? So I, I don't think it's a, it's a good thing that we have a, a president – that has had or has or will have financial connections with our competitor. Um, if you've, I've, I've read some articles that I think uh, uh, are are very clear about sort of the, the the similarity. You know, during the time of the Cold War, if there was a U.S. president, senator, congress congressman, anybody in politics who had financial dealings. With the communist, with the communist Russia or Soviet Union, uh, they wouldn't have been elected in the first place. <laughs> um, well, Bernie Sanders had a honeymoon in the Soviet Union. Oh, but he was just he was just uh, admiring the scenery. <laughs> this is true. This is true. You're right. Um, but I think at the time, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have an excuse for that. But I'm just saying in general, I don't, I don't know very many politicians that uh, can can show a financial, um, any kind of connection with Ukraine or with China. And so I think that, you know, I, I, I think even um, Michael Bloomberg uh, pulled out of the elections this last time around when some people started pulling back the, the curtain to see how, how much investments and how much money he had involved uh, with China. And then he withdrew. I don't know if that's the reason he withdrew, but certainly it started coming out during his campaign. And I think there were several people who said he was the most uh, China friendly candidate uh, among the uh, competitors. Well, it's a good thing that, what was it, the DOJ decided to not uh, let anyone talk about the Hunter Biden stuff until after the election was over. Oh, well, I mean, I think it, there's bigger than the Hunter Hunter Biden himself is the issue that there isn't because you brought up the idea that you know, during the Cold War, it wouldn't have been OK for U.S. officials to have financial ties with the Soviet Union. But there's just this we don't want to recognize that we are that is things are as serious as they are with China right now. Like we're not looking at this as a Cold War. When people start talking about a Cold War, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party starts make, kicking up a fuss and then, you know, we back down or, uh, you know, our government officials don't want to use that term. So there's, I think there's a fundamental difference there where we do not almost want to recognize what's happening. Right. I mean, we, we didn't have, you know, um, we didn't have a Pearl Harbor event yet with with the with the PRC. You know, the PLA hasn't hasn't taken out 
you know, something that, that we can connect to directly and claim that they've attacked us and that now we're going to work to defeat them. What they're doing is, you know, the good example is, of course, the the frog in the in the pan, you know, where the the water is slowly heating up and the frog thinks it's, it's very nice. And, oh, isn't it nice that the, the water's warm? It's like a sauna bath. And then eventually before the dog, the, the frog figures out what the problem is, it's dead in the water. I think that's the, the, the methodology that the CCP is using. They're using, um, they're doing things that are just below uh, a kinetic attack. They're doing things like stealing our technology. They're doing things like um, increasing their economic power. They're using their economic power. They're um, they're conducting you know legal warfare or lawfare uh, in the South China Sea. They're using diplomatic warfare. They're denying Taiwan um, the ability to operate in the UN. Uh, they're doing all these things that are just not enough to make us feel like we're at war. And so we're being cooked slowly. Well, so in the case of Taiwan, since you've mentioned they have not done, they've not brought things to the kinetic level yet. How will, what are their courses of action to take Taiwan from, you know, this kind of salami slicing that they've been doing to actual uh, kinetic invasion? Okay. So just, just, just to make sure I, I didn't misspeak. They have tried to take Taiwan several times. Uh, you know, the the first of all, the, the civil war that was was happening in, in China from 1927 uh, until 1949, when the Chiang Kai Sheks and his forces withdrew to Taiwan, that was the first first kinetic event. Then there was this, the Taiwan Strait crises that happened over the three of them that happened over the last uh, couple of decades. So now. What are they? What are they? What are they doing in terms of preparing for uh, that? Well, first of all, what they claim is is that they would pr prefer to take uh, take Taiwan peacefully. In other words, um, they would, in their dreams, they would in, imagine that the people of Taiwan would vote to become a part of the PRC. That's their dream, right? But their dream is not becoming a reality over time because it looks like. The, the Taiwanese are, are obviously seeing what's happening happening in Hong Kong. They're seeing what's happening with people who are uh, uh, arguing for democratic rights inside of China. They see the discrimination against religion. They just see what's happening uh, uh, in uh, East Turkestan, otherwise known as Zijing. Um, they see that China, that the PRC is not a place that, that they would necessarily would like to uh, end up being under. So some of the actions that, that the PRC uh, or the CCP is doing is actually strengthening Taiwan, their takeover of Hong Kong, for example. That was probably a very important event for the Taiwanese because it helped crystallize what the future would look like under the CCP. But other actions that, that, um, that the CCP are taking are, for example, they're encouraging Taiwanese businessmen to set up businesses in 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 the, in the mainland. They're um, offering uh, lucrative jobs to young professionals uh, to recruit them to do uh, whatever it is, technology work. Um, they're they're attacking them in every dimension, um, except they're not really doing the kinetic part yet. I mean, some of the kinetic part they're doing is, let's say, the the, um, the jets that are flying in in the uh, air defense uh, identification zone off of off of Taiwan, um, both the north of Taiwan and the south of Taiwan, um, and they're doing that over and over again. That's a military type activity. They're they're um, they're the China the the PLA have destroyed two of their own satellites um, in the last. Uh, couple of decades, one recent, uh, one, uh, the Russians did one recently, but, um, <clears throat> they're doing th things kinetically to, to, to practice for the day when they decide to do it kinetically. Um, and they're training their military 
uh, to do amphibious operations uh, with the Russians. In fact, they've trained several times. Uh, one of the points that I think uh, Captain Fennell mentioned, and I, I, I would want to highlight um, in a previous interview you did, um, you know, many people think that the, that the uh, PLA hasn't, you know, is not combat ready. And, you know, the last time they did a, an actual real fight was 1979. But, you know, when you train with the Russians who have lo- uh, got a lot of combat experience, you know, th- that, that training is pretty good. And it and um, it can make up for the lack of uh, what critics say that you know oh the PLA is weak and they you know they don't know how to fight and all this um, but you know training with with a with a with a with an army that a navy and an air force that have done combat operations and are continuing to do combat operations whether it's in Syria, in Ukraine, or internally in, in Russia, uh, that's pretty good training. Um, and so they're doing it in all dimensions and, um, there isn't, there isn't one area where they're not trying to, um, take over Taiwan, even ideologically, they're constantly fighting, uh, the notion that, you know, democracy is good. I mean, they claim that they're a democrat, democratic nation, for example, you know, all this propaganda. So the CCP is... you know, doing everything it can without right now, without actually invading Taiwan. But, you know, if you look at Ukraine and you look at Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's a much easier, a much easier uh, target than, than Ukraine. Why is that? Well, first of all, you know, the military uh, of, of Ukraine is uh, larger they have um, more equipment. Uh, they have uh, uh, they have a larger population. Um, they have um, been they've been under Soviet occupation. You know, during the Cold War, they were controlled by the Soviet Union. Taiwan hasn't um, been under the the CCP. Um, but on the other hand, you know. The, the Taiwanese, you know, have had the U.S., uh, you know, there and they know they know what they they know what they want to maintain a democracy. So if you just look at the comparison, uh, uh, like some people say, well, Taiwan's an island, so it's easy for the the. The PLA to surround it and go in. In other words, if you look at uh, Ukraine, uh, yes, Russia has been able to surround it, but not all parts of Ukraine. For example, there's a border with Poland um, and um, and uh, I think another country as well, maybe Romania. And those are NATO countries. Um, in the case of Taiwan, there is no country next, uh, you know, connected to it that could come to its aid immediately. Um, Japan is close, um, but it's not connected, uh, you know, via landmass. So, Yeah, I mean, we have – the U.S. has troops stationed in the most southern part of Japan, which is Okinawa. Correct. Isn't that useful for a Taiwan invasion? It is if we make the decision to um, send them to Taiwan. It it doesn't do – just like we have military troops in Germany and we move them to Romania or to Poland – we still didn't send them to the U- Ukraine. Now, there were some National Guards uh, guardsmen in, in the Ukraine for a little bit, and they left before the the, the, the conflict started. But we ha- we have to make the decision to move them there. That's 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 the critical critical. Crit- we have we also have uh, military personnel in Guam. We have people in Hawaii. You know, we, but you know we can have them close by. But being close by doesn't necessarily um, make a difference, as we saw in the case of Ukraine. It's interesting that one of the things that Putin kept saying about Ukraine is that, you know, I, I'll promise, essentially, I'll promise not to invade if they promise to never, if you promise never to let Ukraine join NATO. And so he was trying to put NATO and the, these Western countries in this kind of catch-22 where 
they're afraid that they're going to essentially trigger a war by helping Ukraine. And I think that's similar in a lot of ways to what the Chinese Communist Party is trying to put the US or these uh, Japan, these other countries in a position where they're like, well, if you put troops near Japan or, or, or near Taiwan or on Taiwan, or if you say you're going to help Taiwan in some way, if you change the name of your, you know, the economic and cultural office from Taipei to Taiwan, then, you know, we're going to have something to say about it. Like basically trying to make us too afraid to do anything until it's too late. It's a good strategy. Like we don't, we don't want war, but if you do these things, we're going to be forced to, it's on you. You, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of like elementary school when you've got that kid who's like swinging his arms around and he's like, you know, and he gets gets closer and closer and he's like you know if you don't if you don't back out of my way you're going to get really badly hurt and like but like everyone in elementary school knows that 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 guy is the crazy one right right it's not like your fault for well, not I mean, backing away it's it, their fault for being like an insane bully who's swinging their arms around but then you know you don't want to provoke the bully i think that's what they're going for i don't think they care if people think they're crazy i but think but the arms they're... are already swinging how much more <laughs> provoke provoking can you do yeah, I think you're both right. I think you're both right that, that, you know, again, it's it's all about deterrence. They're deterring us from taking action so that they can con continue their actions. And, you know, we have to figure out a way to make it clear that they they shouldn't uh, invade uh, Taiwan. And let me just mention let me just mention just one side uh, side note on on Taiwan. Everyone thinks about Taiwan as kind of like the it. Um, but. Uh, as you probably know, the CCP has claimed uh, ownership of the South China Sea, and Taiwan is part of the South China Sea. So taking Taiwan is, has become a focus, uh, which is important, but it's not the whole picture. They, they view Taiwan as an entry point into the South China Sea. Once they take Taiwan, then the next step, in my opinion, is the rest of the South China Sea. What is the Philippines or, or Vietnam or Malaysia going to do about it? Well, it's certainly clear that, uh, you know, dictators are never satisfied. And I know you've asked, you know, if Hong Kong was for breakfast and Taiwan is for lunch, what's for dinner? Exactly. And so I, thank you. I, I anticipate that that, that that next step is, is the South China Sea because it has such a large amount of gas and oil reserves. They call it the, um, they call it their Persian Gulf. Um, it has um, a large percentage of the world's shipping lanes go through there. Um, it, uh, besides the, the oil and gas resources, there are other minerals there. Um, and uh, it gets them a lot closer to those countries that maybe they, they also might want to intimidate in this, the same way as they're intimidating Taiwan. And getting back to the point about Taiwan um, and, and the bully uh, uh, the bully, the CCP bully. Um, I think, you know, in the big in the big scheme of things, um, you know, we kind of, you know, let dictators do things up to a point. And, you know, what? Where is the point? Where Where do we draw the line? That's what I I want to know. Where Where is it that we say enough is enough? Is it is it is it Taiwan or are we going to let Taiwan go and, and just say, OK, now it's Japan? Um, you know, there are a lot of other countries in the South uh, South Asia or Southeast Asia that we don't have um, agreements with to protect them. Um, so does that mean that we'll just let the rest of those countries, you know, either get um, occupied or controlled by the CCP? I, you know, I want to know. You know, what is our strategy? What is our what is our big picture? You know, what do we what do we want to do now? If you've you read the um, the um, the, strat the strategy statement that came out a week or so ago from the Biden administration about the Indo-Pacific um, arena. And, you know, they repeat the same thing that the Trump administration mentioned is they want to keep the sea lanes open for free trade. That's that's one of the vital interests of the United States. Well, how does that manifest? How do you how do you say what does that mean in terms of those countries that are threatened by by the PRC? 
Yeah, didn't China recently passed um, a, a law that like allows them to? Haven't they basically been shadowing ships that enter the South China Sea? Yes. Yeah. Like yes. this is again a case where their their intentions are very clear. Right. It's just what is when when is the shoe going to drop? See, the thing is, is that you know we see Taiwan as an independent country, but China, PRC, the CCP. You know, they see it as part of China. So they so getting back to the threat thing is what they say is they view anything that they do in Taiwan as being an internal to their country. And anybody who interferes with it is interfering in the internal affairs of their of their country. And therefore, um, they will get the wrath of, of, of the of the PLA. They don't say that to any about any other place around them. It's Taiwan that they say that. And, um, you know, they're, they're using um, diplomatic warfare, they're using legal warfare to set, set the framework under which they can take over Taiwan. Because there are, aren't any countries remaining, except a few, that recognize even Taiwan. Taiwan has no voice in the UN. So if they are attacked, they can't say anything. There's no place for them to go. Ukraine was able to, to make a statement in the UN. And to request the, national, the the UN Security Council to meet, but Taiwan can't even do that. There is they don't have a voice, and so, you know, I think I think you know we have a we have a really big issue to deal with, and I think we're just kind of ignoring it. It well, I mean, it's interesting you bring up the UN Security Council since Russia's currently president of the council, so like they could ask them to meet, but there's not anything that they could do about it, really. Correct. And China is going to support Russia on no matter what they do. Again, if you go back to the 4, to 4 February um, joint statement, Putin's reference to Taiwan, it says the Russian side reaffirms its support for the one China principle, confirms that Taiwan is an inalienable part of China and opposes any forms of independence of Taiwan. That's in their joint statement. OK, that's what the Russians are saying. So, you know, I think this is a quid pro quo situation where obviously this was written and signed on the 4th of February, just a few weeks before the invasion of of Ukraine. Clearly, they knew what was going to happen. And this is this is what. The CCP wanted Putin to put in the document. And then the others, the other quote is it says that the. Uh, the sides, the Russian, the word the sides means Russia and China, believe that certain states, military and political alliance and coalitions seek to obtain directly or indirectly unilateral military advantages to the detriment of the security of others, including by employing unfair competition practices, intensify geopolitical rivalry, fuel antagonism and confrontation and seriously undermine the international security order and global strategic stability. That's the United States. This is the joint statement. The sides oppose further enlargement of NATO and call on the North Atlantic Alliance to abandon its ideological Cold War approaches to respect sovereignty, security, and interests of other countries, the diversity of their civilizations, cultural and historical backgrounds, and to exercise a fair and objective attitude towards the peaceful development of other states. The sides, Russia and China, stand against the formation of closed block structures and opposing camps in the Asia-Pacific region and remain highly vigilant about the negative impact of the United States' Indo-Pacific strategy on peace and stability in the region. They're saying here, basically, they're, they're together on the idea of Taiwan. They're, they're, they're together on the idea of, of not allowing any other country to join NATO. And it's clear to me that they're working together. And I wouldn't be su- I wouldn't be surprised if there's a secret annex that talks about military cooperation as well. It, it's ironic they're talking about you know uh, that they don't want a cold war and that you know there shouldn't be these closed blocks when that is exactly what's happening. We are clearly in another cold war and the closed block of against the cold closed block of Russia and China. Well, mm-hmm. what is interesting is prior to Russia actually full on invading Ukraine. There were there was a bunch of analysis about how well China actually doesn't really want Russia to invade Ukraine because then it would because you know Ukraine 
because when Putin started talking about these um, Russian parts of Ukraine, that's like, oh, well, that's imp uh, like impinging on the sovereignty of Ukraine. And, you know, because China cares so much about its own sovereignty over Taiwan and Hong Kong, then they would look hypocritical if they supported Russia uh, over this. Or, you know, China also has a good relationship with Ukraine and has does business with Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of analysis that I think basically wasn't um, taking into considering what you're saying, essentially, is that Russia and China are definitely working together. Yeah. Well, newsflash, hypocrisy does not deter the CCP. No, not at all. But, well, also, yeah. it also doesn't deter the uh, the analysts who are who are wanting to believe that you know China is our friend. Uh, you know, uh, the last quote talks about the military. The sides call for the establishment of a new kind of relationship between world powers on the basis of mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and mutual mutually beneficial cooperation. They, Russia and China, reaffirm that the new interstate relations between Russia and China are superior to political and military alliances of the Cold War era. Friendship between the two states has no limits. There are no forbidden areas of cooperation. This is China and Russia. Strengthening of bilater bilateral strategic cooperation is neither aimed against third countries nor affected by the changing international environment and circumstances change changes in third countries. I mean, that's clear to me that they're, you know, they're best friends forever, you know? Well, so since this is a Cold War, this goes way beyond just Ukraine. It goes beyond Taiwan. Yes. How how can, uh, I guess, the West wake up and actually put a stop to this? Well, we need to start standing up, you know? We need to we need to figure out what is our, our goals, what are our strategy, what are our, our means and ways to get to those goals, and we need to follow through. If, as you recall... Um, the uh, Trump administration uh, declassified their Indo-Pacific strategy uh, that was written in 2017. They 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 published it just before they uh, the Biden administration came in. So they clearly had a strategy and what they wanted to do. They obviously didn't c complete it because um, we had a new administration. But the new administration is supposed to come out with a new national security strategy. I suspect that the president is going to announce it. Um, on the 1st of March when he gives his um, State of the Union speech. Um, and if it's not in that document, then we still don't have a clue of what we're, what we're doing and what, uh, how we're moving forward. But I think we need to stand up and, and figure out what exactly are we willing to, um, you know, what are our vital interests? That's the bottom line. Definitely being able to post on TikTok. <laughs> That's important. That is. Uh, well, I mean, it just feels like we're watching a very slow motion train crash. Perfect analogy. Uh, and like, I don't know. I mean, what can we do about it at at this point? Like, is there is there anything that American people can do about it? Well, if, if the politicians can't figure out what our vital interests are and what, uh, what our strategy and, and ways and means of getting there, if they, the politicians can figure it out, then I guess we need to, um, we need to uh, you know, help them or have somebody else do it. <laughs> I guess the midterms are coming up. <laughs> Well, a little late for Ukraine. <laughs> I mean, well, here's a question actually about something we were talking about earlier about how China is watching Russia and how they're taking uh, Ukraine. And I think there was some feelings like, oh, well, Russia is just going to do this incrementally. Like they're going to declare that the these like separatist parts of Ukraine are independent states, then they're going to bring their military in to help them. And then maybe they'll go across the border a little bit um, past where the that red line was. Uh, but then suddenly they decided, oh, no, we're going to invade from three sides. You know, I think there's a lot of talk about how Ch China is approaching the South China Sea with the salami slicing or approaching Taiwan with things like the 
uh, Ada's, you know, uh, you know, flying aircraft into their Ada's, like things that seem like slow and slow, but could China suddenly decide to, okay, now we're just going to suddenly do it? Yes. See, you know, both Russia and China have a very long history of deception in their military. Um, so what the Russians did was deception. They made everyone think that it was going to be a slow roll, you know, kind of pacing kind of uh, event. And then suddenly they changed it. That was a deception event. Um, if you if you uh, have an opportunity to read um, Protracted War by Mao, um, he says uh, that deception is not only essential in war, it should be used to the maximum. There's not there's never not enough deception. That's how he uses the phrase. So whatever they're doing to make us lull into a feeling of complacency is sure sign that uh, deception is at work. Yeah, it is similar to the Taiwan situation. There's this idea that like, you know, if they do try to take over Taiwan, it will begin with some of the outlying tiny islands that are a part of Taiwan or the Republic of China. Um, that'll be the same sort of thing. It'll just be a little bit at a time. But yeah, if they just throw everything at the main island of Taiwan, it would help if there were some stronger security uh, backings from the West. And I'm sure the Taiwanese are going to fight, uh, you know, and and hopefully um, they'll they'll be able to push back the PLA, and um, you know, and and hopefully it'll inspire the the West and the and its allies to come to its aid. Um, and if uh, if they're not successful, I hope they can conduct a guerrilla warfare against the the PLA. Do you think that's what's going to happen in Ukraine? Oh, I'm sure it, some of it will happen, but at some point, you know, the, uh, it'll be a, a, a it's a contest of wills. You know, how how much do the Ukrainians who are uh, freedom loving are willing to sacrifice um, versus um, being under the iron fist of Putin and his uh, military and his, you know, his uh, FSB, his his uh, intelligence net. Uh, Oper, you know his intelligence network that he'll be he'll be setting up. I'm sure that uh, you know, and and the same thing is happening in Taiwan. The 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 Chinese intelligence, the Chinese um, military, you know, is conducting you know a, a term I use is and other people have used intelligence warfare. They're trying to co-opt military personnel. They're trying to uh, find out where everything is, where the military is. You know, has um, stored its weapons, et cetera, et cetera. So that, you know, this is a long-term process and they've, you know, they've been developing what we call in the military an order of battle of your adversary. In the case, in this case, it's Taiwan. They're developing where everything is so that when they do attack, they'll be ready to do it. Well, I guess in the worst case scenario, I'm, I'm just going to say, Mr. Putin, Mr. Xi, everything has been just a joke so far. <laughs> Wasn't serious about it. <laughs> and then what we should do, and what we should do is we should fly in a bunch of uh, U.S. military and show up with a bunch of ships and just park ourselves right, uh, right in front of, uh, you know, in, right in front of Taiwan and just say, "Oh, we're just going to stay here for a while." That's yeah. That's what should happen. It's just a cruise. Yeah, beautiful, open seas. The Taiwan Strait is lovely. This time I'm of sure year. That, I'm, mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm sure the Taiwanese people would, would like to, uh, you know, uh, have the U.S. Navy uh, come ashore and and, um, you know, help help uh, with some joint training and uh, some other things that uh, would surely piss off the uh, CCP. I mean, at some point we have to call the bluff, right? We're going to have to do something that upsets them. Well, not necessarily. No, I, yeah, I, th I think actually it's very easy for us to just put our fingers in our ears and just go la 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 la, which we've been doing successfully for some time, Shelley. Ah, uh, but then, well, here's an argument about the TSMC and the whole, you know, global computer chip thing, you know, relying on Taiwan. Is that a is that a strategic thing that's of vital importance? No, because we could just buy them from China. They don't. They can't make them yet. Well, when they take over. <laughs> oh, that's so depressing. 
Yeah, and that's, that's somebody's probably arguing that. Probably get a discount, right? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, the downside is though they'd be made in China. Yeah, discount with 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 some presents inside. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Ah. Uh, Anything more uplifting you'd like to talk about? I know. I, I like to usually end these things on some kind of message of hope, but currently we're in a cold war and we're not fighting. Well, it. no, the, the hope is that, you know, President Harris or Biden, whoever, will send troops to Taiwan and station them there. And if the CCP decides that, that they get triggered by this, then that's their fault. Exactly. Or, so, so we just got to swing our arms around. And if the CCP gets in our way, it's their own fault. Well, that's we what also I was need to do it. We also need to do it in, uh, in all dimensions. We need to do it diplomatically, trade, financial, um, cyber. We need, to, we need to use all of our power to do that. We shouldn't just use one form of power to, to send the message. We need to be unified in what we're doing. Well, that's a very interesting point because I feel like over you know the past several decades, there's been a reluctance uh, for America to want to use its power. The idea that it's unseemly, it's unseemly, or that you know America is really the greatest threat to world peace. America is always the bad guy, and this is like I think pretty even prevalent within the United States, and I think that's hobbling. Well, it didn't stop us from invading Iraq and Afghanistan, so why should it stop us from? A, a meaningful defense of an ally. You know, it, it also reminds me of, you know, when in the, in the, in both Gulf Wars, 91 and, and 2003, you know, Israel is a strong country and um, they, they view their situation as we will fight our own fight, but if you want to come join us, we will welcome you. Uh, that's their attitude. And in both cases, the U.S. sent um, Patriot units um, and um, other other smaller um, uh, units to Israel to uh, ensure that Israel did not get involved with those wars because they wanted the U.S. wanted Israel to stay out of it. Um, but in the same sense, I think that Israel is a good example of what Taiwan should look towards in terms of what it can do. Um, and so it's a small country. Um, Taiwan has got 23 million. Israel has 9 million. Israel is surrounded by a lot of crazy people. Uh, luckily, they have peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan, but still Iran is there. Taiwan is surrounded by sea, but the main, the main, uh, the main story, of course, is the, is the PLA across the border. Uh, and they're, you know, and they're 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 currently fighting. They're fighting the the ideological war. They're fighting the media warfare. They're they're fighting psychological warfare. Um, and the fight is going on. It's just at a different dimension. And I think that, you know, to 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 end on a on a, on a sort of a positive note, I think that uh, Taiwan can look at examples around the world uh, to take their cue from and pursue them. And I think Israel is a good example. So I like that idea. Like even if the U.S. doesn't back Taiwan, Taiwan but on its own will retake the mainland and establish West Taiwan. <laughs> that's where you're going with that. Okay. That's, that's, that's my dream. That's the 100-year plan, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's the world I want to live in. That's 2049. I, I would love to live in, um, what would you call it, Beijing, Taiwan? What? Well, because they call oh. it Chinese Taipei. Yeah. So it should be ta Taiwanese, ta Taiwanese Beijing. Beijing. Taiwanese Beijing. Someday I will visit Taiwanese Beijing. <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining us today. Um, yeah. You know, I, it's, it's sad that we always invite people over to talk about horrible things or when horrible things happen. And the good news is I'm heading towards Taiwan next week. So you must be pretty optimistic about Taiwan. I am. That's great. Why? 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 <laughs> because, first of all, they they've been able to uh, prevent the the CCP from taking them over for the last what is it seventy some odd years. So that's a success story. They 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 haven't been able to do it, and I think time is on the side of the Taiwanese. I think 
over time, the Taiwanese have become more and more convinced that if they were if they were living under the the, the CCP, they would be suffering a lot. And so, I think that um, over time that number is increasing, and I think that that really worries the CCP. They're losing that battle. Well, it's it's interesting because uh, we just did an episode about Nixon's trip to China, and something I found out about it was that like at one point Mao. Mao himself was like, there's no way there could be a peaceful unification with Taiwan. They're all a bunch of counter-revolutionaries. So it's strange that like, you know, even Mao back then knew like, this is not going to be peaceful. And yet there were still people, there probably are t- still today, people in Taiwan is like, this can work out. Well, I mean, to be fair, peaceful wasn't exactly like Mao's go-to. But That's when has true. peaceful been the CCP's go-to if you look at how they treat their own people? They're not a peaceful regime. You know, we talk a lot about um, this sort of asymm- asymmetry, but you're just like there's a North and South Korea, uh, I, I don't see why there can't be in perpetuity the same with uh, Taiwan and the, and the PRC, you know, just – you know, they're two separate countries. Unfortunately, Taiwan is not in the UN, but uh, the North Korea, North Korea and South Korea uh, have representation. And there are a lot of examples. You know, there's South Sudan, which uh, became an independent country. There's um, there's Yugoslavia, which was one country. Now is like seven countries. Um, and they're all independent and they all are existing quite well. Uh, so I, I think, you know, this this. Um, this situation, uh, I, I, I pray for it to continue forever. Unless, of course, like you said, Taiwan takes over uh, mainland, and that would, be, that would be even better. That would be the Taiwanese dream. I mentioned <laughs> to you before the CCP dream. I don't know if it's the Taiwanese dream anymore. It used to be. Yeah, yeah I mean, that yeah. was definitely Chiang Kai-shek's dream, but yeah, I, don't, I think... I don't know. I'm seeing a lot of memes about West Taiwan. Well, that's, that's not necessarily from oh, Taiwanese people. Oh. Shelly, memes memes on the internet represent absolute truth. Uh huh. Well, I, I'm seeing know. a t-shirt here. I'm seeing a t-shirt here. Just so you know. <laughs> Good idea. Take take note of that. I I do think that Taiwan, like it's a it's a situation like, and the U.S. relationship with Taiwan, right? It's a situation where um, things have changed a lot since 1979, but we're not being flexible or like we're kind of not get we're not kind of not getting with the times in a lot of ways like the attitude of the Taiwanese government has changed the attitude of the Taiwanese people has changed in a way where like no way would Chiang Kai-shek have been like yeah fine just call us a separate country that's Taiwan we're not China but now most Taiwanese people are like well we're Taiwan we're not sure we're the Republic of China but we're not nobody wants to go take over mainland China anymore. So there is no reason there couldn't be two Chinas, essentially. But we're just kind of not getting with it. And well, also because the Chinese Communist Party doesn't want that to be part of the conversation because then they lose their, you know, legitimate claim to part of their territory. But, you know, we can say it. I don't really care what they think. But if we want to believe that the Taiwan is an independent, democratic country. Why don't we say that? But we were afraid to even say that because it might offend the CCP. We can't say. We, diplomatically, we can't. We don't say. We don't say. No, we can't say. We don't say that Taiwan is an independent, democratic country. Yeah, I mean, because they've essentially made us believe that, like, if once we say that, it's war. Getting back to uh, you know the fighting guy in in the in in the in, in the kind, in the kind, in the kindergarten, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not. It's not going to be war. Are they willing to 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 start a start a war because somebody you know sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never hurt me. You know, we remember those remember those words. Well, you know, we can say a lot of things, but you know, until they actually do something, how do we know that they're going to do anything? except mouth off at us. Yeah, like the, the, that whole argument is silly because China wants to fight a war when it's ready, not when it's triggered by something. <laughs> but so good luck in Taiwan. Um, 
that'll be a fantastic event. And yeah, again, I look forward to going to Taiwanese Beijing someday. All right. Take care. Thanks a lot for your help. And thank you for watching. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. We'll talk to you next time.